I'm thrilled to be joined by Dichen Wangmo, the Health Minister of the Kingdom of Bhutan. Welcome. Thank you. You've led your country through a successful COVID pandemic response, and in 2021, you were elected president of the World Health Assembly, which is the policy-making body of the World Health Organization. And it was during your one-year term that the idea for a, a global pandemic treaty first came about. Can you explain in a few sentences the goals of this treaty? Thank you, Madeline. Um, I think it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Harvard, for hosting this. Um, I think pandemic treaty is nothing, nothing special. I think these are things that we have known all along. That pandemic requires urgent, immediate uh, action. And for, to be successful in managing pandemic, it's not just the responsibility of one individual or one nation. The country must work together. Uh, so underpinning that uh, health is a basic human right, that everybody sh everywhere should have access to good quality healthcare services, especially during pandemic. So these are broad principles that are already there uh, in many frameworks. So pandemic treaty is basically what we are trying to do is bring everybody on a negotiating table so that we set a common denominator of what is important, what are some important action that needs to happen in times of pandemic, a responsibility from for the government, responsibility from the communities, responsibility of donor agencies, responsibility of uh, multilateral organization. So this is just creating a common denominator for everybody to agree on and that is 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 the pandemic uh, treaty is trying to establish mm -hmm. well where does it stand now what, what's the timeline for pushing it forward I think I'm very happy that uh, in the recent uh, uh, United Nations General Assembly, we had a side event, a high-level side event on pandemic preparedness, pre uh, prevention, preparedness, and response. And we're happy that on the 20th of September, there was a political declaration on the pandemic prepared, uh, prevention, pre uh, preparedness, and response. So there was a general consensus that this is something that the world needs. Uh, that in itself is is a big achievement. Uh, so at least the United Nations, as uh, that has the convening uh, authority, have managed to bring all the member states or all the nation on a same platform. So political declaration that was adopted uh, on the 20th of September this year uh, will then lead to getting the, the pandemic treaty approved uh, in the May of uh, 2024, hopefully during the, uh, the World Health Assembly. Um, and something that is also exciting as a public health professional myself is to know that this is not just uh, a declaration, but I think one of the way forward uh, that was identified in the political declaration is that the Secretary General's office will then convene another meeting in 2026 to really look at how countries are performing and how countries are sort of benchmarking the provisions of the pandemic treaty. So I think, I think we are very hopeful that uh, by next year we should have something to work with. Uh, will it be a perfect uh, treaty or a perfect convention? Uh, not really sure because I think this requires consensus from all the member states. Uh, but, but having said that, I think it does look promising at the moment. Even to get a common consensus that pandemic is urgent, pandemic requires consensus from everybody that people might say, oh, that is common sense. But I think uh, we all know what we went through during pandemic. These are also difficult political discussions. So to have this political will and commitment on a common denominator, that in itself is a, is a, is a big achievement if I look at it. So I think it uh, does look promising, uh, but will it solve all the problems? Uh, I doubt. <laughs> Well, throughout the pandemic, Bhutan and many other countries depended on wealthier nations for crucial healthcare resources like drugs and ventilators and, of course, uh, vaccines. So how does the pandemic treaty uh, improve equity so that uh, no country is left behind uh, 
uh, during the next health emergency? Um, I think I think just every member state recognizing the pre emblem of this political declaration, which says health is a basic human right. Everyone, everywhere deserves a good quality health care, and especially during pandemic. Uh, that in itself is, I think, it's a big political uh, declaration. Now going down to really addressing the equity and, and uh, social justice, uh, I think there is a, a operational cost, uh, I mean clause there that specifies that there has to be certain mechanism put into place. Um, uh, again, will it be a perfect uh, recipe? Uh, I, I think that will be very difficult because different countries have different needs. They have different mandates. So to, to bring everybody on board, that will be a challenge. Uh, so for example, if we were to change um, accessibility issue or equity issue in terms of looking at therapeutic and diagnostics, then we are then chartering into looking at the provision of uh, the World Trade Organization's uh, TRIPS agreement, and that will have to be changed. The patent laws have to be changed. The patent that governs the current uh, production will have to be changed. Uh, so that would require a sort of a, um, a long time, uh, given the commercial interest. But I think recognizing um, that there is a disparity that exists and that we cannot shy away from having conversation around that disparity. And I think that is important. Uh, if we look at today, when we look back, uh, look at the per capita testing that happened during COVID, access to vaccine, 22% uh, and 90%, that's a huge difference. Um, in terms of per capita testing, there's just a huge difference between countries that are well-to-do and countries that are that are poor. And as Madeline, you rightly pointed out, Bhutan had, uh, Bhutan's a small country. It's an import-driven country. We import everything from our basic masks to N95 masks to PPEs to medicines. So when countries start imposing restrictions on, on ventilators, on, on medicine, on PPEs, uh, it put country like Bhutan, small country, um, import-driven country, uh, in a very difficult situation. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm happy that the, the political declaration recognizes that there are many small vulnerable countries. Their interest needs to be considered. Their, because after all, life is a life. doesn't matter where you are. And, 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 and that underpinning principle for Bhutan is very important. Um, uh, so, so I hope that, you know, these things will also be taken into consideration. There are, there are strong language in the political uh, declaration, if you look at it. Um, so I hope that these language will, will help uh, 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 mobilize or generate some momentum towards the sense of equity, especially in terms of vaccine diagnostics and, and therapeutics. Right. Deejan, I'm curious, and, and I'm sure many people in the audience would love to know as well, uh, what was it like to lead this large multinational policy body during such a crucial time in, in global health? I, uh, you know, today when I sit here and I reflect uh, uh, on, the, on the COVID journey, I feel it's a journey that uh, I, I felt the most happiest saddest, frustration, anger, you know. Uh, uh, we held the WHA virtually, uh, and the whole WHO building was empty. <laughs> there were just few people, and there were two big screens in front of us. And almost most of the health minister uh, deliberating their statement and saying, this many mortality, this many children died, this many women died, this many uh, you know, elderly people died. I think for me, the disparity and the injustice became so visible, so close to your heart that uh, you could feel the pain. 
and, and coming from a similar country, you know, you could really feel the pain, the frustration, uh, not having access to vaccine, not having the power to, to do what you want to do, uh, and that is to serve the people that you are mandated to serve. Uh, so I think for, for that reason, um, if you look at my presidential uh, statement, was really lobbying for a humanitarian corridor. And that we need to recognize that life is a life. And then we need to, as a global citizen, must come together. Because it is only through solidarity that we can fight this battle, not through solitudes and isolation. We are so dependent. The world is so interconnected. And unless we recognize that and have concrete action to implement, uh, I think we will repeat the same <coughs> mistakes. And we will lose millions of lives. And, and for me, I think, um, I think never have I experienced such emotions uh, in my life, uh, 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 listening to all of them, not being able to, what are we doing? You know, go home and, and reflect on what are we doing? at our own level. So I really hope that this, this forum that is provided by Harvard, that you will continue to have this kind of conversation in institutions so you can um, intervene and have an impact in global policies. So I feel this is so important to share that part of the story, uh, which, is, which is somewhat forgotten. <laughs> so, so I think, in a nutshell, I think it was a very, um, I would say a life-changing moment for me personally uh, uh, to be heading that. I felt honored, privileged, uh, but more than anything that I felt that there is an opportunity to make a difference. Uh, there is an opportunity to change the discourse that are taking place. So I think those were my emotions. Thank you. You know, this is a good segue. I want to discuss Bhutan's uh, remarkable pandemic response because it, I think it underscores why your country can and should lead global preparations for the next pandemic. Uh, when COVID-19 began spreading in the early months of 2020, Bhutan, which has a population of about 760,000, uh, had only 337 physicians and about uh, 3,000 health workers. Yet you had an impressive track record during COVID. By July 2021, 90% of Bhutan's eligible population was already fully vaccinated. That is those two doses that were comprised of the, the first vaccine. And you've reported only 21 deaths during the entire pandemic. Uh, so I have to ask, how did a tiny country like Bhutan, which, as you mentioned, has so many economic challenges, uh, pull off such, a, such an impressive pandemic response? Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think when I look back today, I think three things that comes to my mind um, from what we have learned, solidarity, solidarity. Um, I think uh, everyone in Bhutan, the small country for people who don't know where Bhutan is, between India and, and China, we realize that the small country we call home is in danger. And that everyone has a responsibility to do something. So under the leadership of His Majesty the King, um, as a moral, sovereign authority, he really united the country. I think probably for the first time in the history of Bhutan, where we are faced with this challenge, and we realized that, oh, we have to do something. So when we looked up, we had only one pinnacle, and, and that was His Majesty the King in the forefront of this response leading this, and he sort of managed to bring everybody together. So, uh, because to us, it was science. It was believing in science. Uh, so, you know, wearing a, wearing a face mask, hand washing, was, was not a political statement, uh, you know. It was science that we believed in, 
and from day one his majesty was very very specific in his guidance to the government and he said do whatever you can to avert public health crisis we are small so what other people other countries can't do we can do because we are small we are agile we can adapt we can change very quickly fairly a homogeneous society believe in science you know so so we have very clear guidance to to follow so i think these things really contributed to us averting a major public health crisis so it wasn't uh, i don't know if i would say success but but definitely we averted a major public health crisis 21 mortality and from where 20 of them had terminal uh, diseases so it was only one who didn't get vaccinated but rest all the terminal patients um, we managed to deliver essential health services. Today, if you look at it, I think there are about what, uh, uh, two, or five, uh, two to five million, depending on what projection you look at it, uh, uh, children under five who did not get vaccine. In Bhutan, we managed to continue our essential health services, continue our health services. So when we take the WHO toolkit um, and look at 69 indicators, of health services and disruption. Bhutan was the only country that didn't have, that had minimal disruption of health services. Uh, and we did that, as Madeline pointed out, with very limited health human resources. So, so I think it is uh, the solidarity, the size, and us being small. Will we, will, do I see this being replicated in larger countries? May not be possible. In Bhutan, the, the vaccination Madeline was mentioning about, we achieved 94% vaccine coverage in four days. In four days. <laughs> and, and if you look back uh, to the graph that is available, you will see many countries going like this. And suddenly from nowhere, Bhutan appears and goes up 90 degrees in four days. Uh, and then today when I look back, it, it, it wasn't vaccination. It was, you know, there was a lot of advocacy. His Majesty sort of setting the tone for the country. The chief abbot, you know, blessing the vaccines and really being a, being a huge advocate for vaccine. So for many Bhutanese, the prick on the arm was not just the prick on the arm but it was a sense of solidarity. It was, it was a gesture uh, to save your loved ones, to save the country. Um, you know, in, in Bhutan, His Majesty said, unless all my citizens are vaccinated, I'm not going to take the vaccine, you know? And, and everybody said, oh, I must do something so that my king is protected, you know? So people came out and took that responsibility very seriously. And I think this, these are the reasons. I, 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 I don't know if you can put this in an equation and model it, but these are the emotions that uh, people felt during the pandemic. So I think these are things that really, for us, uh, we managed to avert a major public health crisis. Uh, Thank you. Now, Bhutan is known for its Gross National Happiness Index, which was the brainchild of the fourth king, uh, Jigmi Singhi Wangchuk. He conceptualized it in the 1970s. So, Dijan, how exactly does Bhutan measure happiness? And, and how did the index shape uh, the country's uh, pandemic policies in particular? I think um, if you look at, I don't, I don't know, if people who are not familiar with the GNS, so we have uh, indicators, but major, we have four, four pillars uh, of GNH, and, and that is sustainable social economic development, uh, conservation, then we have preservation of our culture, and good governance. Um, and if you look at the component of good governance, uh, good governance is always based on trust. So from day one, His Majesty was uh, uh, very eloquent 
in, in, in putting the trust component in the good governance. So for pandemic, for that matter, if you look at pandemic, um, there was a lot of trust and confidence in the governance, you know, in the health system. So a trust that was built over many, many years, many decades, we managed to rip the benefit of it. So when health ministry said, you know, I would get on the television and said, oh, tomorrow we are starting vaccination, people must come forward for vaccination. There was a trust and confidence in the system, in the health system, in their leaders, in their political leaders, in their monarchy. So that uh, is something that we often uh, don't talk about. Um, I think the recent review uh, that was presented at the United Nations is also that there is a uh, deterring trust element in the systems uh, and how this, the lack of trust has led to so many uh, um, lives being lost. So, so, so when we talk about good governance element, we are really primarily talking about the trust and the confidence. And that is how uh, the Ministry of Health benefited from it, you know, the trust in the health system. The second one, when we talk about socioeconomic uh, development, you know, uh, it, it will be uh, wrong to say that Bhutan did not suffer economically because that is very clear with the dip in the GDP. <laughs> we did suffer. But from day one, the guidance was very clear. If you go back today and watch some of the YouTube, I think it's available in the YouTube, His Majesty's National Address, he said, let's first save lives and think about the economy later. You know, for us, prioritizing life over livelihood. And that was set from day one, that life was important. Livelihood can wait. And now when I say livelihood can wait, it wasn't like it was ignored. So there was a simultaneous rollout of the KIDU, uh, a program uh, from His Majesty's office. People who were affected economically were supported uh, through His Majesty's office, you know. So, so, so then when we look at socioeconomic, this is how sort of that pillar sort of guided how, how we wanted to do things. Preservation of our culture. Uh, there is a very strong belief in, in goodness, in compassion, in doing beyond what you uh, do every day. Uh, so that also, again, contributed to our response. Uh, bringing in the chief abbot, bringing in the monastic institution, bringing in alternate uh, complementary medicine, not just one pathy, allopathic medicine, but also bringing in other pathies and saying, okay, let's see what we can do and work with, you know. So, so all these other uh, uh, cultural aspects sort of contributing uh, in our uh, 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 intervention as well. And of course, environment, I think we had little more oxygen because we are carbon negative country. <laughs> so, so, so all these aspects. So I think in the decision making, um, I think we, we often reflect to, to that, that philosophy of, of development, which is very unique to Bhutan. Um, um, so that also guided us in terms of designing our interventions, designing our strategies, designing our, our framework. Uh, so I think this is part and parcel of, of whatever you do in Bhutan. Interesting. You know, Deejan, I would love to talk with you about your inspirational journey in public health. Uh, you came to the U.S. as a college student to pursue a career in medicine but you ultimately made the decision to switch to public health instead. Uh, what prompted that change, and would you do it again? Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I, I, I um, you know, when I came here, I wanted to become the first cardiologist uh, for Bhutan. I was very passionate to go into medicine. Uh, but then as I took the pre-med, uh, I did get through the MCAT exams. Um, then I realized that uh, that's not really my cup of tea. I, I've interned in, in the Children's Hospital in Boston here, at the Mass General, at the Brigham and Women's, and I was trying multiple things to see if this is really my cup of tea. Um, and then I realized uh, this really wasn't getting me anywhere. Uh, so I had to give the very, uh, uh, 
disappointing uh, news to my my parents saying I'm not going to become a doctor which is you know oh. <laughs> instead I'm going to pursue something else um, and 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 when I I, I went to Belize uh, in Central America and I had an opportunity to work there uh, uh, mostly working with uh, with HIV patients and um, HIV uh, people in, 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 in prison. I fell in love with public health then, uh, especially with HIV, and I said, I think I need to do something. I went back to Bhutan. I started the uh, NGO uh, for, for Positive Network, and then I said, oh, this is really what I want to do, you know. So that's how I decided to, to, to become a public health professional, and I'm very passionate about it, and I feel um, I think there is a greater need to integrate uh, medicine with public health uh, so that we are able to understand <coughs> and have a very holistic view of, of health, and health not just as treating disease, but health as fixing systems, fixing policies, fixing legislations, and, 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 and really um, creating a well-being uh, society. So, so I think uh, uh, so far so good. Mm -hmm. I can't say about the future, but so far I'm enjoying it, what I'm doing. I'm, 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 I'm glad that I made that decision. I would have made a lousy cardiologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because my heart would not be in it, and that is the biggest <laughs> irony. <laughs> Teacher, what advice would you have for people who are starting out in public health today? I'm curious, what do you know now that you wish you had known back then? Uh, oh. I think there's so much we can do. <laughs> we always think that, oh, medicine is, is very noble because you get to save lives and do all that, you know. But then you realize that public health, I think, um, you can even do greater things. Um, uh, the policy, uh, yeah, if you really want, you can not just influence policy in your communities, uh, in your countries, but in the region, in the world, and, and world needs public health. Not every country is rich. Uh, not every country can afford the most sophisticated machine. Not every country can afford the most advanced medicine, targeted technologies. Um, there are many uh, uh, that uh, a public health intervention would have a lasting impact on, on health system. So I think, I think we think, oh, it's a, it's a very narrow thing that we can do, and we don't get to call ourselves, especially where I come from, doctors, you know. But, but there's a lot of things that you can do. You can fix policy. You can uh, medicate a failing legislation. You can operate on a very poor policy. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of opportunity. Um, I, I, and I'm, I'm of a belief that I think uh, we need to integrate uh, public health uh, in our medical curriculum, um, and which is exactly what we are doing in Bhutan. We are starting our medical college next year. Uh, this year, this month, next month, actually, we are launching our medical college. And, and we hope to integrate, uh, we, our curriculum will have a very big aspect on, on, on public health. Wow. Dijin, thanks so much for sharing your insights and perspectives and for reminding us that every human being matters and that when we prioritize the health and well-being of all people, as you say, we can achieve extraordinary things. And a warm thank you to our audience for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day.